Hello, my name is Joseph Dismore. I'm speaking on a topic today called the self-determinant will. I would like to bring up first a uh, 15th, a, a man in the 1500s called Francois Rebellius. He's the one that coined the term in the Abbey of, in the fictional Abbey of the Lima of do what thou wilt. He was actually making it a parody of the monastic institutions and abbeys of the 1500s of the of the Christian era. Uh, but the main tenet of that of the Abbey of Thelema that he had conceived of as built by the giant Gargantua, uh, the main tenet was do what thou wilt. What does this mean, do what thou wilt? What well, we also find in Aliester Crowley's writings, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That is in his Liber Alba Legis, or Book of the Law, as brought forth to him by Awas, his holy guardian angel. This is what is considered as the magical will. I would like to bring out several points about the word will. We find in the Oxford Angel English Dictionary that the word will is the faculty by which a person decides on and initiates action. And I coin that self-determinate will would then be expressed not in the context of an action caused by necessity, but of an action or of a willful action brought about by spontaneity by the, the person themselves. And reading further into the paper that I wrote some years back, um, the doctrines of will or thelema is central doctrine of Aliester Crowley, Liber Al Veligus, or Book of the Law, and whose si system the central doctrine is that knowing one's true will is the ultimate purpose and destiny of every being that is summed up in the following phrases from Liber Legis, in my opinion. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Liber Al, chapter 1, verse 40. Love is the law, love under will. Liber Al, chapter 1, verse 57. The word of the law is the lima. Liber Al, chapter 1, verse 39. And there is no law beyond. Do what thou wilt. Liber Al, chapter 3, verse 60. The true will is a magical idea that can be described in its dynamic aspect as a singular path of possible action that encounters no resistance in going because it is supported by the inertia of the whole universe. And according to Magic and Theory and Practice, Theorem number 9, page 15, a man who is doing his true will has the inertia of the universe to assist him. The true will can never contradict another person's true will because each one has its own absolutely unique career and its passage through infinite space. Hence to follow one's true will means to respect all true wills described as love is the law, love under will. Again, Aliester Crowley states, Know firmly, O my son, that the true will cannot err, for it is thine appointed course in heaven in whose order is perfection. Liber Aleph, page 13. The philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte explains the nature of the spontaneity acted of the pure ego for which the true will is embedded within. Now the absolute or pure ego is not the individual finite self but an infinite better unlimited activity. As spontaneous activity, the pure ego does not exist for itself, it comes to exist for itself. As an ego only in the intellectual intuition by which the philosopher in transcendental reflection apprehends the ego's spontaneous activity. It is through the act of reflection, through an activity directed towards an activity, that the ego first comes to be originally for itself. In intellectual intuition, therefore, the pure ego is said to posit itself, and the fundamental proposition of philosophy is that the ego simply posits in an original way its own being. 
In transcendental, re transcendental reflection, the philosopher goes back, as it were, to the ultimate ground of consciousness, and in his intellectual intu intuition, the pure ego affirms itself. It is not demonstrated as a conclusion from premises. It is seen as affirming itself and so as existing. To posit itself and to be are, as said of the ego, completely the same. Johannes Gottlieb Fichte, A History of Philosophy. I'd like to read again in Fichte's Transcendental Philosophy, The Original Duplicity of Intelligence and Will, authored by Gunther Zoller. On chapter 5, section 5, Thinking and Willing. The intellectualist restriction of the practicality of the subject holds equally for Fichte's usual usage of the term willing to describe the moment of resolve and concentration of force involved in the mind's passing from indeterminacy to determinacy. So it is actually, as this said here about the pure ego, it, it posits itself in its opposite. Or, or in the thing that, that opposes it. Whereas the act of willing imposes a freely willed limitation to one path of thinking at the expense of all others. He also speaks of th the thinking and the willing as thinking of the willing is to be understood not objectively as though the willing were being thought about but subjectively as referring to the kind of thinking that willing is. So willing is not an objective thing that we're going to find or we're going to reach out and acquire. It is a type of thinking that is relayed within the mechanisms of the mind of the person doing the willing. It's a category of thinking. Yet Fichte also considered willing as something to be encountered by thinking as something that is found. So here he says that he had considered that it could be found and then taketh up another thought. The relation between thinking and willing is thus not one of ultimate identity but one of mutual requirement. In Fichte's own words, I will in so far as much as I think myself is willing and I think myself is willing in so far as I will. His point there seems to be that the doing of the willing needs to be seen. That is thought in order to have reality for the individual I. In pure willing and thinking, Fichte's account of the relation between willing and thinking in the new presentation of the Western Schaffler is ultimately grounded in a distinction he draws between empirical willing and pure willing. So there's the natural will or the natural will of the man that would seek after food, shelter, clothing, uh, a career, the things that would present themselves as natural conditions of a man's life <clears throat> or natural conditions to where one would make a choice of one thing over another and then the pure willing, and here's the distinction he gives. The distinction follows closely the one introduced by Kant between will occur, choice, and will a, will, with the former standing for the power of deciding between alternatives and the latter referring to an original pure self-determination preceding the opening up of any alternatives. So the pure will would have already been determined before there were any alternative choices to be made. Fichte argues that in order to be rational, the willing has to operate under the conception of the end that is being willed. This presupposes cognition, so it even goes before thinking. So the true will of the pure, of pure will would happen before one would even think about thinking to express their true will. At this point, Fichte conceded a circle in his account for the I. No acting without knowing and no knowing without acting. Yet pure willing, although presupposed in all thinking, 
is itself affected by the conditions of thinking. In line with the intellectual nature of the I, pure willing is taken up by thinking that is brought under the form of thinking and the process, pure willing, the universally presupposed ultimate source of determination, is itself determined by being thought or reflected upon. So we can create this internal psychological will, this true will, this magical will, or this pure will, by thinking upon it. Uh, he covers one area where he says it was not presupposed that it would be by thinking, but then he said it another time, in reverse, that it's as a circle. To break out of that circle, we have to let, let our intuit, intuitive aspects of our intelligence take over in the willful act of willful thought. This is a deep subject and there are many other philosophers that deal with it. I know that uh, Nietzsche deals with the aspect of the power of will in his Thus Spoke Zarathustra and there are many other philosophers that have tried to deal with it well too. And they have all got very good points about it, and I thank you for your time today. Uh, this is the end of the session, and as I further discover some new truths about the true will, I will express them in another video. Goodbye.